Now listen. Because I don't know if you really understand. I don't know if you really understand that some little girl is not going to take her clothes off for some kind of pervert. But today, there's been a change. Somebody shout yeah. And we teach something in Alabama, Eddie. We teach something in Alabama. We teach that Thanksgiving will seal the deal. In the South, we mind our manners. And when somebody does something for us, we say thank you. I wonder if in Sacramento today, we could give God the biggest thank you we've ever given him. in the air. Some of y'all are still worshiping like you think when you're going to get to heaven they're going to tell you to turn to page 286 in your hymnal. But when you see those nail scarred hands and hair as white as wool and eyes that flame like fire and a sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth and a voice that sounds like many rushing waters. You're going to lose your Father, we pray that this is a break in the dam. 
I pray that this is the beginning of a breakthrough. That you are turning the state of a nation today. And we say yes. We say yes. We say yes. In Jesus' name. Sit down if you can, if you can find a spot there in the hard concrete. Father, we pray today that in Sacramento we would find fellowship with the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus. I pray that today in the place of sacrament that we would find fellowship supernaturally with the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. God grant us contrition. Purge us with hyssop. Let us come into a place of wholeness that can only come through the gate of brokenness that can only come through the place of the cross. We glory in what you've already done. We glory in what you're about to do. But most of all, we glory in who you are. There's none like you. There's none beside you. In you we live and move and have our being. Some of you have come into a place today already in this gathering of true repentance. I've seen some of you march toward that cross. Others of you have knelt down in the heat of the California sun to make decisions for Jesus. But when I began to fly into California yesterday, I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, it is time for the next dimension of the Nazarite consecration. Many of you that were not involved in the call 10 years ago that have not watched a decade of maturation that has brought the American church to a place of real revival, you may not understand what we mean when we say Nazarite consecration. But God has always and will until the end of the age look for a people that have gone to the next level in setting themselves apart for the kingdom of Almighty God and the moving of the Holy Spirit. These are the ones that become the tip of the spear, that become the momentum for the great moves of God. And I don't think it is by coincidence that 10 years ago, on the steps of the mall in Washington, D.C., 400,000 young people gathered together to pray and fast, yes, to worship, yes, but more than that, to make their lives a consecrated offering that they would be set apart for God. And 10 years later, we find ourselves in the greatest dispensation of revival of the modern age. They're in revival in Kansas City right now. They're in revival at Bethel in Reading right now. We are in revival at the ramp in Alabama right now. I got a call this week from John Kilpatrick. They're in revival right now in Daphne, Alabama. Listen, friend, those are just the ones that I know of and I'm not real well connected. But I don't think it is coincidence that we find ourselves 10 years after a consecration in the midst of a great outpouring. I'm also not under the naive notion that all of those people that made that consecration stayed that course. Yet I believe there were some that made a decision 10 years ago. I believe there's a remnant, an army of Jesse Ingalls that made decisions to walk upright before God. And 10 years later, we are reaping the benefit of that. What happens with God is over the ages, there becomes an acceleration of the clock. God does not live in time. He lives in eternity and speaks into time. 
Time is virtually irrelevant to God except that it sets boundaries for the finite mind to operate in without confusion. And if God, 10 years after the call in D.C., is pouring out a great revival on America, then I believe that we could see something happen in a day that it took 10 years to get to happen 10 years ago. I want to show that. I want to show you why I believe that can happen. Because you prayed about sex trafficking today. You prayed about it today, Benji. Today, you prayed about sex trafficking. And God did not answer 10 years from now. God answered today. And in the midst of a great famine in a city called Samaria, God raised up a prophet to speak to a king. And he said, about this time tomorrow, a shekel of flour, a, a, a seah of flour shall be sold for its usual rate at the gate of the city of Samaria. And the Bible says, a man on whom's hand the king leaned heavily, said, if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could it not be so? The prophet looks at him and says, you'll see it, but you'll not taste thereof. They were in a moment where God was responding to prophetic declaration immediately. We were just in Alabama, and I've been building. I want to tell this story. We were in Alabama last Sunday night, and I was preaching, and we had $330,000 of debt to get our ministry completely out of debt. And a lady by the name of Karen Wheaton, who we co-labor with there that helps lead what God's doing in a place called The Ramp, I'm preaching, and I turned and prophesied to her. I said, how much is the debt? The financial administrator said it's $330,000. I turned and looked at her, and I said, it ends tonight. And I began to preach that about this time tomorrow, God would turn things around. 19 hours after that prophetic word, $330,000 were wired into the ministry. Listen, last week, in the middle of a national recession, God turned something around immediately because people released their faith. It is amazing what could happen today in the shadow of the cross. If we are depending on the shadow of the call, we are limited. But if we are depending that we are living under the shadow of the cross, we are limitless in what God could do through this gathering today. And if I don't do anything else, I want to build faith in you to believe. Now, some of you did not see what just happened right. How many, Benji, fewer pairs of blood-stained pajamas will there be because Craigslist has said enough of in any way contributing to sex trafficking. Things, listen, I want you to hear this. Things are changing. And the, the teaching of the modern classic evangelical church is today you're here changing things, but I don't believe it. I believe today the cross is changing things. And your commitment to walk in proper alignment with the cross is what shifts things. I want to read you a couple of quotes. When Lou called and asked me to come here and preach on the cross, God had been speaking to me. A man by the name of John Scott wrote, The cross is a blazing fire at which the flame of love is kindled, but we have to get near enough for its sparks to fall on us. D.A. Carson, leader of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, said, I fear the cross without ever being disowned is constantly in danger of being dismissed from the central place it must enjoy by relatively peripheral insights that take on far too much weight. Whenever the periphery is in danger of displacing the sinner, we are not far removed from idolatry. The cross is not a symbol. And communion is not a ritual. It is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, friend. In a day and an age in the church, and I don't want to go too far down this road because I can get real negative real fast. In a day and an age in the church where 
We seem to be bending the scripture to fit our lifestyle instead of bending our lifestyle to fit the scripture. God is raising up a people with a radical commitment to holiness and a true revelation of grace. Grace, listen, does not mean you'll get to the end of your life and God will excuse all of your activity in the earth. And when the cross is not the blazing center of the Christian experience, we start creating heresy that says God will not judge sin. But if you heard the power of the message of Revelations 2, Listen, friend, your children can die under grace. I want to let that sink in. Ananias and Sapphira did not die in the Old Testament. There is still judgment for sin. Your homosexuality is still sin. Your heterosexual promiscuity is still sin. And as quickly as we want to take our superheroes of the faith and give them a separate set of rules and let them live however they want and still prop them up on our, in front of our television cameras and pay attention to their gift instead of their character, there will still be judgment for sin. And in my personal life, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me happened to me March the... 3rd, 4th, and 5th of 2009 where God began to bring a great spotlight in my life concerning my own sin. March the 3rd and 4th and 5th of 2009 I was preaching just by the sovereignty of God in some of the greatest churches in the world. Our ministry was growing beyond belief. We were adding staff we were having to assimilate crowd control in different places. God was moving. I don't mean that arrogantly. I mean to tell you in the middle of that great explosion, I felt the spotlight of heaven come into my heart. And I began to see things about myself that began to disgust me. And in that moment, I was so tempted to gravitate toward a message that said, It's okay. God is full of love. It's okay. God is full of mercy. These are just natural temptations and they're natural issues and everybody goes through this. And Lou, I wanted to believe that God would grade on a curve. And I didn't have to live according to the Bible. I just had to live a little bit better than all the people I went to church with. But Proverbs says in judging ourselves against one another, in so doing we prove to be unwise. You are not the standard. And I am not the standard. And the call is not the standard. And your church is not the standard. And Christian television is not the standard. The blood-stained cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is still the standard. Friend, I want to tell you the good news is measure up or reap the consequences. And we've said that doesn't sound like good news. We've said that the new good news is live however you want and God's full of love and mercy. I know that's not good news because I lived however I wanted to live before I got right with God. You don't have to be under any government or any law, and that's freedom. That's not true because before I met Jesus, I was under no government or no law, and I was in absolute bondage. We didn't bring you here today to tell you if you jump high enough and you sweat enough and you fast long enough, you can ignore the fact that there are parts of your life that you have been unwilling to bring to the cross. To my knowledge, this is the first call event that there's been a 60-foot cross erected in the middle of the gathering because the next dimension of Nazarite consecration is going to be more than long hair. It's going to be people that have laid down their lives to live at the foot of the cross. And I, maybe if I had more faith today, I could believe that all of the thousands upon thousands of people that are here would make that consecration. But I really came just looking for somebody. Just somebody who says, I don't care how my friends live. 
I don't care how the people I go to church with live, and I certainly don't care how they live in Hollywood. I have stared at the I have stared at the bloodstained cross until I have so fallen in love with the redemption that it pays for that I can settle for nothing else. A.W. Tozer said, the cross that saves us is the cross that slays us. Anything short of this is pseudo-faith and not true faith at all. Friend, listen to me. God saves you by slaying you. God saves you when he takes the old nature that has defeated you on every level and he brings that old nature to the cross and he nails you there. No less than 19 times I've found an association in the New Testament between water baptism and the cross. God trying to show you that the cross is the place you drowned. And the good news is not that you can learn to manage your sin. The good news is you can kill the sinner. Hear this. The blood is for sin, but the cross is for sinners. And Jesus never said, deny yourself, take up the blood and follow me. He said, deny yourself, take up the implement of torture built for flesh. And I'll make you a disciple. Listen, friend, the mercy of God is not your, an excuse for your ongoing immorality. The mercy of God is the prize that pushes you to the cross. And to the man and woman who wanted to behave the way they have in the past, literally lives no more. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Listen, I know the debate. This is where I get in trouble, so this is going to be the end. I know the debate that you're trying to determine whether or not you were born homosexual. And I've heard the medical argument. I've heard the biblical argument. I've heard stretches on that on both ends. I don't know whether you were born gay, but I know you weren't born again gay. And Jesus did not die on the cross so you could manage your homosexual sin or your heterosexual sin. Jesus died on the cross so old things could be passed away and all things could become new. I love you today, friend. Listen to me. I love you. But I'm telling you, I tried to have a big ministry and manage sin. And I almost died. I tried to have a successful marriage and managed sin and almost died. Christianity is not sin management. Christianity is when you go to the cross with the name Saul and come off with the name Paul. Christianity is when you come, stand out in the heat of the day, and you know, like Corey was speaking of earlier, in three weeks you're going to be tempted to revert back to your previous behavior. But I want to tell you, friend, listen. God today, through the grace and mercy of the cross, will give you the ability to die to sin and to die to the things of this world. And listen, the cross will go from an implement of torture to the greatest companion you've ever known on this planet. I revel under its weight today. I'm frail. I'm constantly in danger of falling. Except for the grace of God, there go I, the righteous man falls, yea, seven times, but he keeps on getting up. I'm not here to tell you, listen to the perfect preacher, tell you how to live the perfect life. I'm telling you, listen to the broken man that found help in the cross that I could never have found in a thousandling, thousand counseling sessions or a hundred books. There's help at the cross for you today, and I so don't want your emotion I so know how, especially young people, when they get in a crowd with each other, they have a tendency and a temptation to want to respond the way their friends respond. Today you might leave here dead to your friends. And you may leave here dead to the boyfriend that you're worshiping beside but you fornicated with last night. But I want to tell you, the cross 
beckons the man who is sick of himself. And if you're tired of winning some days and losing other days, if you're tired of being clean some days and being dirty other days, and you want to know what it's like to say, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Holiness without which no man can see the Lord. I want to tell you what your eyes were born for. I want to tell you what your eyes were built for. They were built to stare in the fiery eyes of your Messiah Redeemer until you ache with pain to spread his gospel. Listen to me, that you would stare in the love-filled, burning eyes of Jesus until you hate what he hates and you love what he loves. I found out that when you come to the cross, they don't ever have to talk you into praying anymore. They don't ever have to talk you into worship anymore. They don't have to talk you into tithing anymore. When you come to the cross... And you get a real, I'm not talking about you get, you get to your church's Easter cantata and singing Christmas tree. I'm not talking about your 35-minute church service with your coffee and donuts. I'm talking about when you get the real Jesus and you get the real cross and you get the real gospel. And you say, I deny myself. I take up that cross. And I'll follow you. I want every person here to bow your head and close your eyes today. I found that God never asked men to go to the cross in groups or in pairs. God asked men to go to the cross in spite of their groups and pairs. God's looking for people that will say yes to the next dimension of Nazarite consecration. God is looking for people that make a covenant with their eyes. God is looking for people that don't waste their life with Facebook and Twitter. God is looking for people that say yes to the radical cross and everything that goes along with it. People that have said yes to the cross give up their money. People that have said yes to the cross give up their reputation. People who have said yes to the cross they give up their time. People who have said yes to the cross are willing to give up their own dreams. People who have said yes to the cross give up classic religion and the fallacy of popular Christianity and they say yes to the Jesus that hung on that cross. Friend, it's not another mega church that's going to change America. It's certainly not another mega pastor that's going to change America. It's not another hot worship song. And it's not another Christian book. It's going to be when a generation says, I don't care what the cost. I say yes to the cross. If it means I spend my life in Libya preaching the gospel to unreached people groups, I say yes to the cross. If it means my family forsakes me and my friends mock me and I say goodbye to the pleasures of this world, I would rather have the companionship of the cross. Let's quit changing the rules to fit the culture and let's start changing the culture to meet the standard. Grace is not God lowering the standard. Grace is God through the cross empowering you to meet the standard. Hear me. Grace is not God changing the standard because of the culture. There are things we would never call pornography in this day that would have been pornography 10 years ago. There are things that we would not call sin today, that our fathers would have called sin. And the problem is we've moved from the cross to church growth principles and we've raised a society of anemic people who do not understand the laid down life. 
Grace is not your permission to change the standard. Grace is God's empowerment for you to meet the standard. Many people have argued with me. One of my specialties in theology is apologetics. And so I find myself oftentimes in gatherings of great leaders talking back and forth with our theological apologetics. And oftentimes, oh, hallelujah. Oftentimes what they'll say is, what you're preaching sounds like legalism. And I say it only sounds like legalism to the person that has not stepped into the freedom of meeting the standard by way of the cross. Hear me, friend. Jesus is still the plumb line. And the stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And we're going to still have to meet the measurement of the standard of the cross. When I find myself in these apologetics gatherings where we're discussing our theology, people will continue to throw at me, we're not under the law. We're under grace. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But let me help you because in the Old Testament, the law said do not commit adultery. Under grace, Jesus said, if you look at a woman as to desire her, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. The, the law said, do not murder. Grace said, if you have hate in your heart, you've already, the law said, if you want to divorce your wife, I'm going here, I'm going here. If you want to divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. Grace said, save for the cause of adultery, you cannot get divorced. There's a standard. And I don't want to leave you with the standard. I want to introduce you to the grace to meet the standard. That he who knew no sin became sin that I through him might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Friend, listen. The cross is your permission to change. It is your empowerment to rise to the standard. It is the necessary grace and mercy for transformation. And some of you are not making the standard because you said yes to the church and not the cross. You said yes to your favorite worship band and not the cross. You said yes to a 35-minute relationship with Jesus every week, and you have yet to respond to the cross. If you're in this gathering today with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you believe God's calling you to the next level of Nazarite consecration, don't tell me that that's just the way you are. In a minute, you're about to hear some testimonies from people that were suicidal and they're not that way anymore. Testimonies from people that were involved in gross sexual sin and they are not that way anymore. We got a young man in Alabama that got saved. Hallelujah. About two months ago, Lou, he's a neo-Nazi skinhead. He's got swastikas tattooed all over his body. He dealt in crystal meth. He cooked crystal meth. He stabbed a man 19 times in the penitentiary because of the color of his skin. And last Sunday night, Eddie, I looked over in our service, and I had everybody join hands and raise them. And I looked in that white hand. Harry Jackson was intertwined with some black fingers and there's still to this day a swastika tattooed between his eyes. And that arm that was raised in the air intertwined with that black hand still has a swastika tattooed on his forearm. And he testified, I don't know what happened, but I came to the cross and all of the hate that I had for people with different colored skin was ripped out of my heart and I could feel his love. This can only happen at the cross. But I want to tell you whatever you came in here dealing with, 
It's been so afraid of the day you would come to the cross. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this gathering today, the only reason I tell you to bow your head and close your eyes is not so you can hide, it's so you can focus on you. So you can get introspective and ask yourself, when God looks into my life, is he pleased with what he sees? Or am I full of compromise and negotiation and game playing? It's time for the next dimension of the Nazarite consecration. I want to tell you, friend, if you have continually, overtly, consistently fallen into sin, there is grace for you today. I want to tell you that his mercy is new every morning and his mercy endures forever. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm not giving you today a gospel without grace and mercy. I'm just telling you, the gospel of the cross will help you meet the standard of holiness. And you can see what your eyes were born to see with every head bowed, every eye closed if there's compromise in your life. As simple as that. As simple as that. If there's compromise in your life and today you want the freedom that only comes at the cross, then on the count of three, before your pride can tell you not to, and before you can worry about anybody else's opinion, if there's compromise and you want it gone so you can step up to the cross, I want you to stand up on the count of three. One, two, three, stand. Lift both hands in the air. Would you come to the cross today? Would you say yes to the redemption paid for through the shed blood of Jesus? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. Come on, he'll still do it, friend. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I if you'll say yes to the next dimension of Nazarite consecration I want you to turn and face that cross again say yes to the cross at the cross at the cross say yes to the beautiful blood-stained cross burdens of my heart rolled away He'll change you, friend. You was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy. Happy oh, is the man whose sins are forgiven. He'll say yes to the cross. Say yes oh, to the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. There's grace. And the burdens of my heart. If you're watching my television, stand up and say yes to the cross. If you're watching my internet, stand up and say yes to the cross.
and I never felt like I belonged anywhere. I never felt loved. And I just kept asking, what is love? Who am I? Where do I belong? And those questions led me to seek the answer in Buddhism, which was my, my parents' religion. And then when I came, became frustrated with this longing for the answers and not being able to find it, I went into devil worshiping. I joined an Asian gang in Los Angeles and I started dating women. And sin leads only to one direction, and that direction is death. So at the age of 15, after a lifestyle of just total sin and rebellion, I held a knife to my wrist. And a girl named Janice shared with me about Jesus. And I said, whatever, you just want another notch on your belt. You don't care about me. But her words were echoing in my head as I held the knife to my wrist. And I just said aloud, Jesus, if you are real, show me and I'll give you my life. And a bright light entered my room and started walking towards me. And all the darkness in my heart started being revealed because his light exposes our darkness. And I started remembering all the times that I slept with my girlfriend, all the times I did devil worshiping and cursed God, all the times I went into Buddhism and beat people up when I was in a gang. And I closed my eyes because I knew that I deserved hell beyond a shadow of a doubt. I had no argument to offer God. And I grew up Buddhist, so I believed in karma. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. And I knew I deserved bad. So I closed my eyes thinking, I'm going to open them again, and I'm going to see the flames of hell, which I deserve. But instead, as my eyes were closed, I felt him embrace me. And he just kept whispering in my ear, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that's why I stand here before you today transformed. It's his love that has transformed me. And it's his kindness that has led me to repentance. And he answered in that moment of encounter with him face to face the three questions that I asked my entire life. Who am I? I am his beloved daughter. I am the one that he came down from heaven to die on a cross to redeem. That's who I am. Where do I belong? I belong in his arms. That's why he held me. And what is love? Jesus is love. And there's no other answer to all of our questions that we're asking in our hearts but Jesus. I believe there's a generation just like me asking these questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? What is love? And maybe today they're called freaks and outcasts and loners and homosexuals. But there was a generation 50 years ago, just like our generation, that sought for it in rebellion, sought for it in re Eastern religion, sought for it in their own com communes, communities. But Jesus started saving them by the thousands. It's called the Jesus People Movement. Can we believe again that God wants to do it again with the generation of outcasts, freaks, loners, menaces to society? Maybe right now they're in the gay community. But Jesus can show up to them just like he showed up to me and change them with an encounter with him and his love. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you, God, that you are what we're looking for. You are the answer to the questions of our hearts.
You are the answer to the seeking of a generation. God, would you speak to a generation, even as you did in the 60s? Who are we? We are your children. We are your beloved. We are your sons and daughters. We are the ones that you came to die on the cross for, to redeem and save and set free. Where do we belong? We belong in your family. We don't need to watch modern family to tell us what family is. We just need to come and look at churches. And I pray that churches will be an example of true family again, God. And Lord, what is love? Would you show a generation what love is so that they could get saved by the thousands, Lord God, because they know the answers and Jesus is the answer in Jesus' name. My name is Nathaniel Flock, and this is my wife, Tiffany, and my daughter, Selah. And uh, she's a little sign and a wonder because uh, the Lord that delivered me from homosexuality he healed my wife's womb after three devastating abortions, and he gave us this little girl. And when I, yeah, praise the Lord, please. When I was three years old, I had my first homosexual thought. And the thought itself, I, I can't even say on the mic, no three-year-old should have been thinking it. And I was not molested. I was not introduced to porn at that age. There was a spiritual thing that took place. And it's so vivid, I remember it. It carried through until about uh, my middle school years when I actually began to act out in the homosexual lifestyle. By high school, I was already in an electronica dance music scene. I was DJing. I loved the free drugs. I loved the worship and uh, all the promiscuity that came with it. And by the time I moved to South Florida from Atlanta to pursue my career in a, in a greater measure, I ended up selling my body for drugs to whatever man would, would get me high. And I was at that point all through that, that time. I still believed in God. I was raised in a Christian household. And I said, Lord, this is all I feel. This is all I feel, but I, I know you have something better for me. And when I was at my lowest of low, the Lord came and delivered me one night from drug addictions in an instant. A week later, I was having night terrors for months and months where I'd literally have to wake up and smoke weed every morning just because I couldn't get out of bed because the night terrors were so bad. And a friend of mine said, hey, the Lord delivers you from drugs. Why don't you pray about your dreams? And so I said, Lord, would you remind me in my dreams that I can pray to you, that you're real, that you're a God and you hear? That night I had a dream and I was in a fortress and this water was rising and it was crashing over me and this giant snake was wrapping its body around me and it was strangling me and I couldn't breathe. And I look on a distant wall in the fortress and there was a cross hanging there. When I saw it, I didn't think Jesus, I didn't think crucifixion, I just, I knew I wanted to touch it. And so I, as long as I kept my eyes on the cross, I could, I could swim and, and the snake didn't have a power over me. And the second I touched the cross for the first time ever in my life, in a dream, I remembered there's a God and I can pray to him. And I said, Jesus, save me. That was it, the simple prayer. And in that instant, the snake in the water disappeared. And I woke up and literally the blind, the blindfold had been lifted off my eyes. Fort Lauderdale didn't look the same. I almost didn't even recognize my condo. I was terrified. And the voice of the Lord was so strong. And he said, you need to call your parents. You need to repent to them for dishonoring them. You need to leave South Florida. You need to go back and you get plugged into their church. And so I took those steps. And about two months later, the Lord had wooed me and wooed me. And I was still living as, I guess, what you would call a gay Christian, which doesn't even make sense. But I took that, that moment in a sermon when the preacher was talking about, if you want to follow God, you have to leave things behind. You have to keep leaving things behind. In that moment, he wasn't preaching about homosexuality. He was just preaching about sanctification. And... In that moment, the Holy Spirit said, you have got to renounce homosexuality. You've got to renounce it. And it had all I'd, been, all I'd known since I was a little kid. And Lord, this is all I feel. This is all I've known. I don't know what it's like to be attracted to a female. It was the scariest prayer I ever prayed. And I said, it was so weak. And I just got on my knees and I said, Jesus, whatever you want from me, I renounce homosexuality. I just did it in faith. I said, Lord, I renounce it. If this, is, if this is not your best, if this is evil and wicked, then I renounce it. I just want your best. He had wooed me in those two months so much. He romanced me. A week later, it wasn't even a week later. I didn't even really think about that prayer ever again. A week later, all I could think about was getting married and having kids.
It lasted about two months. All I could think about was getting married and having kids. I had no attraction to men whatsoever. He just flipped the switch to show me he can do it. The next five years, though, I had to wrestle with God because the attraction started coming back. And the Lord started teaching me. And he said, pursue the knowledge of the cross. You're the rest of your life, just study the cross. And as I did that, the Lord told me, he says, you have got to learn how to put off the old man every day and put on the new man who is created according to the likeness of God and righteousness and purity of truth. And when I put on the new man, the desire is gone. When I stop listening to my feelings and let the feelings define my reality, instead of looking to truth, his name is Jesus Christ, by the way. When you look to truth in a man, you're not looking towards your feelings to define your reality anymore. And some of you are struggling with it and it's like, this is all I feel, this is all I know. Look to the word. Jesus is truth. He's the way, he's the truth in life. It is not relative, it is not subjective. The truth is Jesus, and he sets us free. This is what we're going to do right now. I... Damon, come up here. We did this at the ramp, and I feel that there's so much maybe shame wrapped up in this. But I think it's time we have altar calls for people struggling with this. And we won't freak out. We'll pray for him. Can we do that? All across this place, you, said, you know, maybe you've never brought it out, but I, I feel today it's right that if you want to just say, I need prayer today, nobody's going to look askance at you. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God does not hate homosexuals. He loves people. And if that's you today, you would like to just raise your hand and say, I, 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 need, I need help. But you say, you want to raise your hand today because I'm dealing with these issues. Maybe just be a handful out here today. As you say, I, I need prayer. Are there those today that would raise their hands and say, it's me, son, the young man there. I want people to gather around that young man. The Bible says you come and open this thing and God can free you today, God. Others, raise your hand. I believe this could be a day where the church could turn the corner on this. Others are raising their hands. Gather around our sister. Just sing it, Eddie. Take it to the cross right now. Take it to Jesus right now. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by the faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burdens of my heart they rode away It was there by the faith 